Good morning, Open Bible Church. Welcome to all of you and to those of you that are joining us for the first time. We want to welcome you. At this time, what I'd like you to do is just check in. For those of you that are familiar with what I'm asking, just go ahead and text to the number 408-547-4911, the word here and your first name. And for those of you that are new with us, we welcome you. If you would text the word connect to that number, 408 408- five four seven four nine one one then uh that'll take you to a uh, a prompt on the um website and then you can just fill out the information there and please make sure you leave your first and last name we need to know who we're communicating with who signed up and uh also this is a great way for us to communicate back with you we send texts every uh every week or so just reminding you of certain things that are going on in the church or for the service coming up and so we'd like you to be a part of that as well. You can also share your prayer requests, text the word prayer, share with us a little bit how we can pray with you. You can also give if you, if you would like to give uh, to the church, you can give on the app as well, text the word give, follow the prompts, it'll take you to the giving portal on the church website. Uh, if there is anything that we need to know, how, you, uh, how we can come alongside to serve you, uh, if you're just checking in, Uh, Please text to that number and we get it immediately and that way those is prompt and efficient communication going on in that regard. So before we move into uh, our time of worship and into our message this morning, uh, I just want to share with you a scripture found in Romans chapter 15 verse 13. And Paul is writing to the church and he says, um, God of hope, I love that, God of hope. Fill me with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit I may abound in hope. So here we have the God of hope and we're praying to ask that the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit, would fill us with the spirit of hope. And so this morning that is my prayer for you. God, that you would fill us with your hope this morning. Come alongside of us, encourage us, strengthen us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you in just a few minutes for the message. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransomed fully before. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free. Wash it. It's 
Darkness rejoiced, so heaven had gone. But then Jesus arose with all freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Welcome back, everyone. We are so thrilled that you are joining us as we have just started a new series on the book of Galatians. 
and we're following the theme of standing on grace and you'll see why in just a moment why this is the main theme of the book. Um, you know, when I think of Galatians, and we talked last week that it was written around 49 AD, which is one of the very first books ever written in the New Testament, and it is uh, designed to um, encourage the church as it's dealing with a major issue. But when I think about the book of Galatians, I usually think of it in terms or in relation to uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and the, um, and the idea of that is, is I kind of lump those four books together, almost like you would lump Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together as the Gospels, and so I call these the, uh, the Gospel of the Epistles in my, own, in my own understanding and in my own uh, reasoning. And the, there is First and Second Thessalonians that follows, and, and I don't really include that in this, uh, in this lump of four books, but the um, reason being is because more, more sermons and lessons are developed out of these four books um, individually as well as corporately than there is anything out of First and Second Thessalonians. Does it mean that? First and Second Thessalonians is any less than, but it's just kind of how my brain works and, and just how I look at things. And so just like with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the book of Acts, who was written by Luke. So Luke not only wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the, um, the, the book of Acts. And so the, the way that this is, in my mind's eye, is set up and, and put together um, I, I look at Galatians as probably, I, I would see it as maybe number four out of those four books of the epistles. And, and with um, Ephesians, Philippians probably being a close one and two, and then Colossians being three, and then Galatians being four, ranked in the order of, I guess, my, what I like. Um, I, I've taken a serious step back because I, I have found out in my study of Galatians that it's a pretty amazing um, book in the sense that there's a lot, of, um, a lot of history to it beyond just it being in the Bible. Martin Luther uh, utilized the book of Galatians as a catalyst for him to leave the Catholic Church, put the 95 Thesis, nail that to the wall of the Catholic Church, and began the, the Protestant movement um, as, they, as they moved out of the covering of the Catholic Church. And, and Galatians was one of the main factors for that because the theme behind Galatians is saved by grace and how we are saved by grace, not by the law and not by own, our, our own works, our own effort. And a lot of that is seen in Ephesians as well, but specifically for Galatians, since this was the, um, the earliest book written for the New Testament, um, it was written for the very purpose of teaching the new or the early church uh, about what, what this faith walk looked like. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, As we look at where the church is at the time, we go back to the book of Acts and we see how um, in, in Acts chapter 11, the, uh, let's go to back to Acts chapter 8 where it talks about persecution scattering the early church that was in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was the uh, early setting for the uh, Pentecostal movement where the gifts of the Spirit were, were just in operation with tongues and interpretation and, and uh, the move of the Spirit with healings and, and just a really powerful demonstrative part of our history within the early church. And the, um, the city of Jerusalem was the landing spot for Jews from all over the world who came to celebrate the Passover. And when Pentecost happened, a lot of these Jews got saved. 
and under the ministry of, of Peter, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But the, the church itself, they was growing leaps and bounds, but they weren't going anywhere. They all stayed there. They didn't want to go home to their other countries. And so what ended up happening is God utilized persecution to drive these brand new Christians back to where they were from, to their home. And the area of Galatia that we're talking about is an area where um, in uh, Asia Minor, where the, the early church got its, got its bearing and got its foothold. And it was there that um, a lot of the early Christians were trying to figure out what it looked like to live out their faith in Christ. And so there was this crisis going on there in Galatians where Paul is addressing this very, very issue. So in Acts chapter 2, we're going to be talking about the, um, we're going to look at, at the end of the message, we're going to look at the end of the, um, the second chapter, and, uh, which is going to be the, the title of our message this morning, and it's called Living a Crucified Life. Living a Crucified Life, what does it look like? Well, the tension, as we discussed in, in the churches right now that Paul's addressing in chapter 1 and chapter 2, um, the, the good thing about this is, is that Jews and Gentiles are getting saved. And I mean, we're talking massive amounts of, of Jews and Gentiles are coming to Christ and, and, and they're, they're starting to come into the church and now the church is trying to figure out what to do with them. So... They're having a little bit of trouble defining what this is looking like. Well, when you think about it, you have the Jews and the Gentiles, and they were natural enemies, basically. They, they really didn't have anything to do with one another. And now, because of their faith in Christ, they are being thrown together in this uh, dynamic called the church. And now they're trying to figure out how they're going to become a blended family, so to speak, between Jews and Gentiles and how that was all going to work. Well, the Jews had this very um, uppity mindset when it came to their lives and who they were and, and how they lived their lives. And so they kind of brought that attitude into the church and, and they began to look at these Gentiles as less than because they didn't go through what they had to go through as a Jew to become, I guess, uh, cleaned up, so to speak. And, and not only in following the law, but they had to be circumcised. And so they were coming into the church and there was a group of people that were trying to, um, trying to uh, come against Paul and his teaching. And what they were doing is they were telling these other Gentile believers that you're not really saved until you are circumcised. And so Paul was having to deal with that. And so Paul wrote this book in order to address the problem with these, with these individuals that were coming in and spreading this false gospel, as we read in chapter 1. So if we look at chapter 2, it, it starts off with Paul saying, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. And this is about 14 years was about the time from Paul got saved to this time. So there's a, all kinds of stuff going on within the, the world when it comes to the, the element of the church. He said, I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So Paul is seeking clarification, not so much from them but to put it out there and let them know, okay, this is where I'm coming from. Verse 3 says, not, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated, infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Jesus Christ and to make us slaves. And what that meant is slaves to the law again. And we'll address that again later on. And he goes on to say, we did not give them, we did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul immediately resisted this teaching and hit it head on. He says in verse 6, as for those who were held in high esteem, 
Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. Again, it's that attitude that the Jews brought in that made them believe that they were greater or better than the others because they had fulfilled the law in order to become saved. Paul says that's not, that's not how this works. God doesn't show favoritism. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So Peter was primarily in ministry to the Jews, and Paul was in primarily in ministry to the Gentiles. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as the apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. And so even as they're trying to bring the, the Jew and the Gentile believers together, there's still some separation as to, um, as to the strength of ministries between Peter and Paul. Paul reaching out to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, and so the, the ministry focus of these two individuals was different, but yet they're trying to bring both of these two groups together. In verse 11, Paul begins to unravel the problem. He says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For, for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? You see the issue here. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 15, we who were Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles uh, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of because by the works of the law no one will be justified but if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners does not that mean that Christ promotes sin absolutely not if i rebuild what i destroyed then i would really then i really would be a lawbreaker we're going to get into this in just a little bit um, as we as we delve into the second point of my message and then um, Paul talks about in verse 19 uh, what I'm going to be referring to in the th third part of our message. He says, for, though the law, but for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for righteousness could be gained through the law. Christ died for nothing. So we're going to be talking about what it looks like to have that crucified life. And I want to break down this letter that Paul is, is, um, is writing to the, to the church for this very reason. What does it look like to live a crucified life? Well, the first thing is it's not about me. To live a crucified life, it's not about me. A lot of times in our faith, we try to make it all about us. God, you know, what's in it for us or, or God... You know, what, uh, in the idea of works, God, what do I need to do to, to get your favor? What, what, I mean, so the focus is right here when our focus should be right here. It's not about us. And the problem that happened was Peter was, um, was fellowshipping with the Gentiles and having a good time and cutting up and, you know, they were breaking bread together, probably telling jokes and just living life and, but whenever the, the Jews would show up, Peter would walk away from the Gentiles and then hang with the Jews and ignore the Gentile believers. And to the point that other Jews who had relationship with the Gentiles, when these certain Jews would show up, would also leave, thus 
basically acting like they had nothing to do with them. And that brought Barnabas into the picture and, and really brought some confusion to him and, and confusion to the whole church as a whole. And Paul called them hypocrites. And the interesting thing about this is Paul called him out. And, and the idea of that is um, uh, Peter and Paul aren't just two random guys who didn't know each other. They were very well known to each other. Because if you look at the early part of the book of Acts, um, the, you could see where these two had history together. They, they were in opposition with one another before, before Paul got saved. If you remember Peter, Peter was the catalyst behind Pentecost. He was the one who got up right after the, the Holy Spirit came down like fire on, on the people's, people's lives and and Peter began to preach, and over 3,000 got saved. So over the course of Peter's ministry, thousands of Jews gave their lives to Christ. And the church exploded because of what Peter did and, and how Peter uh, preached the message. And so Peter was very influential and instrumental in the establishment of this early church. Many of these people probably had gotten saved under Peter's ministry and uh, in the early development of the church in Jerusalem. And then many of those uh, others maybe got saved through those who had gotten saved. through. So his influence and his reach was powerful. And so then you have Paul, who was the driving force behind the persecution of the early church and was opposed to the message of the gospel and was doing everything he could to, uh, um, in, in, in all sincerity, he thought he was doing the right thing because of what he believed in with the, with the, with the church, with the, with the Jewish synagogue. And so what ended up happening is when Paul got saved, now he was brought into this mix of relationship with, with Peter. And I don't know what kind of uh, relationship they had had um, uh, up to that point of Paul writing this letter, but you could see where Paul basically calls Peter out. Because Peter was the more mature one, so to speak. But Paul was the one who recognized that what Peter was doing was an act of hypocrisy. And the thing with that is, is that they were putting the emphasis on, um, on your works. And the fact that what made this group that Peter would gravitate towards so much uh, supposedly better than the other group was because they were, they were staunch supporters and followers of, of the letter of the law, so to speak. That, that's what they wanted to believe. And they believed that when you follow the letter of the law, that was part of the salvation commitment you made to Christ. And so what ended up happening is Peter was, um, was promoting, supporting the ideology that you were saved by what you did in your actions by especially through the act of the one main focus was the act of circumcision and if you weren't circumcised you weren't saved basically and so in order for these gentiles to comply and really prove that they were saved they had to be circumcised according to the um the jewish judaizers the ones who would um, who, who were basically saying that salvation is based on following the Jewish law. And so the, the interesting thing is now that they're working together for the sake of the gospel, Paul is pointing out this hypocrisy according to, um, according to Peter. And he was, he was calling him out because even Barnabas, and Barnabas was... Uh, was a very influential Jew himself, and, and he, he had, um, had done so much to help advance. In fact, he was one of Paul's best friends, and he had done so much to advance the gospel wherever, wherever Paul would take him to all these missionary journeys. Barnabas was there with him. Barnabas was a great influence um, to the church, and so here Barnabas is now confused. And so Paul was, was trying to bring clarity to this particular situation, because it's not about what you can do. 
So to live a crucified life, it's not about you. It's not about you at all. And so the, the second point is, in order to live a crucified life, we have to realize it's been done for me. So it's not about me and what I do, but it's been done for me because of what Christ did on the cross. And Paul talks about this element of justification. And we don't talk about this much because it's a pretty, um, I want to try to simplify it. It, it is pretty uh, deep, but I want to try to simplify what Paul meant when he talked about being justified. And he said, we are justified, justified by faith and not by works. Verse 16, I know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the idea of that, it means to be justified, means to be pronounced or treated as righteous. So when Christ died on the cross for our sins, that act of sacrifice that he did brought an act of justification on, jo on God's behalf towards who we were as, as um, individuals in God's sight. That we were no longer sinners because we are now justified. We have been declared righteous. Not by what we did, but by what Jesus did. So it takes it out of our hands. So therefore, it's not about us, but it was done for us in order that we might be saved. And so justification is not earned through our own works. Rather, we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that our righteousness is as filthy rag. So our righteousness isn't good enough. So in order for us to be accepted by, uh, by the love of God, or excuse me, not the love of God, but by the salvation of God, God had to take care of everything for us. So it wasn't about us, it's not about us, but it was done for us because of, what God, uh, because of God's love for us. So justification is a completed work of God. It, when Jesus did it, it was done. In John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, there's the, um, there's the story of Jesus on the cross, and it said that um, Jesus literally, in two uh, places in that verse of Scripture, said that his act of his dying brought justification for our sins, and that was it. He, it was a done deal. Chapter 19, verse 28 of the book of John says, After this, when Jesus knew that all things were now completed. And that word completed is the same word that Jesus used when he, um, when he talked about, two verses later, um, of himself when he said, When he received the sour wine, Jesus said, It is finished. So that word completed and that phrase, It is finished, is a, um, is a Greek word called tetelestai, which means um, it is done, it is finished. And the idea of tetelestai means that there was nothing more that needed to be done because everything that needed to be completed was completed through that act that was committed. Um, when, when people finished off paying a bill, they would write on that bill to tell to tell us die. And that means that it is it, it's paid in full, paid in full. And if something is paid in full, there's nothing more you owe on that. And so when Jesus said it was now completed and it is finished, he said the the bill for our salvation is paid in full. There's nothing more you can do. That's what justification means. We were justified by faith. And we, are, we can only receive the justification of our salvation through faith. And that's why when we look at what Paul was addressing with the church, he said, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to do it this way. All you have to do is, is what Christ has asked you to do, and that is to be saved. That is to receive him, accept him, follow him, serve him. And when you make that commitment and surrender your life to him, everything that needed to be done to get you saved has been done. 
It's completed in its entirety. And then the third thing is living a crucified life means Christ now lives in me. Christ now lives in me. So it's not about us, but it was done for us in order that Christ may live in us. That's what living a crucified life means. Verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So if the law worked, if these actions that these believers over here were calling on the Gentile believers to fulfill, if they, if they worked in the first place, then Jesus never would have had to come to die on the cross. Do you understand me? Because now what they were doing is they were, they were calling out the Gentile believers to do things that initially brought Jesus here in the first place. And that was the fulfillment of the law. Even the Jews couldn't live up to the fulfillment of the law. And now they're saying to the Gentiles, you have to be just like us. And Jesus said, nah, -uh. otherwise I wouldn't have had to come. I love what it says. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So to, when we look at a crucified life, we realize it's not about us, but it was done for us in order that Christ might live in us. The very essence of the law, which did not work, is the very reason that Jesus came in the first place to die on the cross so that we might be justified through faith in our salvation. So what do we crucify? What are the things that we're called to crucify? We're called to crucify sin. And that's that original sin that separated us from God. Then we're called to crucify self. And that's the ongoing sin. That's that sanctification process. We are called to, to, to crucify ourselves. And then we are called to crucify our flesh. And the idea of crucifying our flesh is that very nature that battles our spirit. When we wake up in the morning, we, we will be faced with choice after choice after choice after choice. And the decisions that we make in those choices determine the battle that goes on between our flesh and our spirit. Paul was great about describing that through the early parts of the book of Romans. If we look at chapters 5, 6, and 7, uh, those are powerful scriptures that describe this battle that goes on within us. And then what dies? What, what do we crucify? Sin, self, and the flesh. What dies? What dies is the desire to live for our own selfish goals and pleasures so that we may place God as the top priority in our lives. God has to be not just first, but the very center of everything we do. And when, when God becomes that place, then that's when that's when, um, when he is able to do a work of sanctification in our lives. But before we get to that place, we have to, we have to surrender our lives to him as an act of salvation because his, his salvation is, has justified us before him. We have been declared righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because of that, we are able to, to um, allow Christ to live in our lives. And out of that, we now have the tools and the strength and the power and the authority and the process by which we can live a transformed life for God. Matthew chapter 16. I want to close with this. Verses 24 through 26, Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit the soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What Paul was, or excuse me, what Matthew was saying here is that that struggle that we have in coming to him, when we, when we surrender our lives to him, when we live a crucified life, we, we every day, becomes that, that day where we are able to, um, to crucify our lives for him. And because of that, we allow Christ to live in us. And when we do that, we, we're able to learn how to surrender our lives um, for him in that regard. So as we close out this morning, I want to challenge you this, today to live a crucified life. What does it look like? In other words, we realize it's not about me but it was done for me in order that Christ may live in my life, that he may live in me. And so I challenge you this morning, will you take that challenge and will you live a crucified life? God has done so much for us in order to get us to that place. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do and you heard me say this, to get God to love you any more than what he loves you, there's nothing you can do to get God to love you any less than what he loves you because he paid it all on the cross through Christ so that we might live a transformed life, that we might learn how to live a crucified life in him. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can text me at that very number we gave you earlier, 408-547-4911. I would love to talk to you more about what it, what it looks like to live a life for Jesus. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you. Even when I can't see it And even in suffering I have to believe it If you say it's wrong then I'll say no If you say release I'm letting go If you're in it with me I'll begin When you say to jump I'm diving in If you say be still then I will wait if you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own way. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. It felt like a burden. But once I could grasp it, took me further, further than I was asking, and simply to see you, it's worth it all, my life is an altar, it's your fire fall, if you say it's wrong then I'll say no, if you say release I'm letting go, if you're in it with me I'll be I'm diving in If you say be still Then I will wait If you say to trust I will obey Teach me how to follow In your way I'm done chasing feelings Spirit lead me all I've got I have to believe still bring water from the rocks to satisfy my thirst to love me at my worst and even when I don't remember you remind me of my word I don't
Cause you're all there 